So I realize that we're still getting to know one another. Um, so you're getting these little glimpses of some things about me as I'm getting glimpses of some things about you. One another, another glimpse I'd like to give you this morning is the fact that I like to read. I read a lot. And while a lot of the things that I read tend to go in one ear and out the other, I read something recently that I have not been able to forget. In fact, I want to share some words that I read with you this morning. In his book, Unapologetic, Francis Spufford writes this. My daughter just turned six. Sometime over the next year or so, she will discover that her parents are weird. We're weird because we go to church. And as she gets older, there will be voices telling her what that means. It means that we believe in a load of Bronze Age absurdities. It means that we don't believe in dinosaurs. It means that we're dogmatic, that we're self-righteous, that we fetishize pain and suffering, that we advocate wishy-washy niceness, that we're hair-shirted enemies of the ordinary pleasures of parenthood, shopping, sex, and car ownership, that we're savagely judgmental, that we think everyone who disagrees with us is going to roast for eternity, that we oppose freedom, human rights, individual moral autonomy, modernity, progress, that we cover up abuse because we care more about power than justice. That we're the villains in history, on the wrong side of every struggle for human liberty. That we provided pious cover stories for racism, imperialism, slavery, and exploitation. That we're stuck in the past. That we think the world's going to end. That we want the world to end. But hey, that's not the bad news. Those are the objections who, of, of people who care enough about religion to object to it. The really painful message that our daughter will receive is that we're embarrassing, that we're inexplicable because we have committed ourselves to a set of awkward and abstract attitudes which obtrude, which stick out against the backdrop of modern life. Is anyone else feeling uncomfortable right now? I was really uncomfortable when I read those words, and I am really uncomfortable after reading them again, and not just because I read them in church. I'm uncomfortable because it's true. Not that we are all those things, but it's true that that's how much of the world sees the bride of Christ. Somehow, the church has become known solely for what we're against, or at least what people think we're against, rather than what we're for. So somewhere along the way, it seems that our friends and neighbors and co-workers have started seeing us as somewhat of a caricature of the community that Christ calls us to be. Now, I think it's fair to say that some of this misperception may be self-inflicted. I think we can all acknowledge the fact that sometimes the way that we as Christians have responded to culture and to politics and to social media and to science does tend to paint a picture like the one that Francis Spufford just speaks of. But that isn't who we are, is it? It isn't who God says we are. And in fact, I read something else this week that I have not been able to forget, and I want to share this with you as well. I hope that you will not forget this. Here's what God says we are in 1 Peter 2.9. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, God's special possession. And actually, that's what it says in the NIV. Here's what the King James Version says. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right off the bat that I don't, I'm not that big of a fan of the King James Version. No offense to those who are, but I'm going to go to the king on this one because I think it's true. Following Jesus does make us peculiar, odd, weird, if you will. Weird in all the right ways. That's because following Jesus should cause us to stand out, not just for what we're against, but actually what we're for, the shalom that Kenneth just prayed for. Following Jesus should cause us to be good neighbors, great neighbors who, who can't be ignored. To borrow some words from James Bryan Smith, following Jesus should cause us to be a good and beautiful community that collectively points the world to a good and beautiful God. That's what we're going to spend some time talking about this fall. Who we are, who God has called us to be, how we might actually follow Jesus in a world which is at best indifferent and at times opposed to our faith. 
We're going to use the book of 1 Peter as a guide to consider the oddly attractive ways that Jesus might actually show up in our lives and point others to a good and beautiful God. We're going to start today in the opening words of 1 Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1. And so if you have a Bible or a mobile device and you want to turn there, you're welcome to do so. You're also welcome to buy, borrow a Bible from under the seat. Uh, while you're finding 1 Peter, there are two quick things that I do want to note. First of all, if you're thinking about reading this book because your pastor talked about it in a sermon, that's a great idea. It actually is a great book. Francis Bufford has a way with words, including lots of four-letter words. So just giving you a heads up in case you decide to read this because your pastor recommended it. The second thing I want to encourage you to recognize is the fact that 1 Peter isn't actually a book. 1 Peter is a letter. It's a first century letter. Which means we're about to read someone else's mail. And I won't ask you if you've ever done this before, but if you've ever read someone else's mail, you realize that you're only reading half of a conversation. I'm telling you this off the bat because we're going to have to do some work at times to understand what's going on behind the scenes. This will be really important to remember when we get to some of the more controversial issues that First Peter addresses. If you're wondering what those controversial issues are, I don't know. He talks about things like slavery and so-called gender roles. Stay tuned for that. But today we're going to begin where First Peter begins with something that is not controversial at all. In fact, we're going to consider something that I think every person on this planet is looking for. Hope. Hear these words of hope from First Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect... Exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all of this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while you may have to have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even, through fi even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith the salvation of your souls. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So like I said, Peter is a letter. And because it's a letter, it, it, it starts out the way you might expect the letter to. It starts out with a greeting. Peter introduces himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. That is one of the original 12 followers of Jesus. And he greets his readers, whom he refers to as God's elect exiles. That is specifically first century Christians who were being scattered throughout the Roman Empire because of their faith. People who were being driven from their homes because of persecution. Now, it's certainly possible that God's people got scattered throughout the Roman Empire because of many reasons, but the primary reason actually is persecution. It's because Rome did not take kindly to nonconformists, and for some reason, this strange, good, and beautiful Christian community just wouldn't conform to the rules of Rome. Now, Peter will talk explicitly about the persecution that the early church endured when we get to later chapters, chapter 3 and 4 explicitly, but he gives us a preview in his opening lines, and he basically says this, Hey, people of God, 
Whether you are where you want to be in Jerusalem, or whether you are in any of these cities that I just mentioned, whether you are there by persecution or by choice, I want you to know that you have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. You are exactly where God calls you to be. Now, Peter gets pretty reformed here, which can make some people uncomfortable, including some reformed people. But he isn't trying to spark some debate about how God's sovereignty works with human freedom. He is trying to remind his friends that God is always with his people. That God is always at work in his people. And amazingly, God is often at work through his people. Peter says, you have been sanctified by the work of the Spirit. You have been marked by the blood of Jesus Christ and you are called to be obedient to him. To stand out. To be weird in all the right ways. To live a questionable life in all the right ways. A life that might stop, cause people to stop and ask, what's going on? Why did you do that? Why are you like that? How do you have so much fill in the blank. Uh, Over the course of walking through this letter, we will see a number of things that fill in the blank for those who follow Jesus. The things, the odd ways that Jesus should show up in our lives. But it starts where our faith starts, with hope. I realize we just read this, but hear these words again. Peter says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are being shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. It's a bit of a mouthful, but what Peter is essentially saying is if you belong to Jesus, if you follow Jesus, you have been given something that cannot be taken away from you. You've got, you have something that endures through all things, even things like persecution. You have an inheritance, a hope, a hope that is sure. A hope that is sure because it is kept in heaven for you. In other words, it resides with God. It rests in God who is sovereign. And because God is sovereign, his plans for you, for his people, and for the world will come to pass. Jesus, who lived and died and rose again will return. He will bring God's good and beautiful kingdom with him. He will make heaven and earth one. He will renew all things, even you. Of course, there are a couple things to note about this here as well. First of all, this inheritance is described as a gift. Peter says he has given us new birth. This is a gift and a gift has to be received. God blessed the entire world when he sent Jesus into it, but the world has to receive Jesus. We have to receive Jesus. This is where it's important to remember who Peter is writing to. He's not writing to the world at large. He is writing specifically to followers of Jesus who belong to him, who are clinging to him in the midst of fiery trials. I I point this out because it's important that we recognize before we consider anything that Peter calls us to do The invitation is to receive Jesus. If we don't receive God's gift in Jesus, frankly, the stuff that Peter's going to talk about today and in coming weeks will not matter. I mean, we can certainly do the things that Peter calls us to do. There might be some great benefit in that. It might make you a better neighbor. But it won't save your soul. Behavior modification will not save our souls. Only Jesus can save our souls. He is our hope. We have to receive him. That leads me to the second thing that I want us to note, and that is the fact that Peter refers to this hope as a living hope. It's an important word, a living hope. It tells us that our salvation is not this passive thing. It is not this ticket that we punch to heaven and now we're just sitting and waiting for God to do something. It isn't a trophy that we put on this shelf to admire. Like, remember when I prayed that prayer and made that decision? This is a living hope. It's a way of life, a new way of life, an ongoing reality, an active hope that changes everything. An active hope that sustains us through all things. Even the things that we would rather not endure. 
know, when Peter writes to these first century readers, he says that they are enduring all kinds of trials, and he specifically mentions the trial of persecution. I want to be careful here because I think it is true that we, as followers of Jesus in the 21st century here in the United States of America, we face trials of all kinds. The world is broken and so are we. We endure the hard realities of this life, but I would dare to say that I don't think we face persecution in the way the first century church did. A day may come when we face persecution like that. Certainly Christians in other parts of the world face persecution like that. But chances are you and I don't face persecution like that. I'm sorry, being asked to wear a mask is not persecution. Neither is being censored on Facebook. Despite what anyone says, to the contrary. You and I don't face the exact same trials, not all of them, that the first century readers who Peter wrote to did. But the point still remains. We have a living hope that sustains us through all things. We have a living God who is at work in all things. Even through things like persecution and suffering and trial. No, I don't think that means that God likes to see us suffer. I don't think it means that God actively causes us to suffer. I think it simply means that God is able to work through all things. And, you know, we could have a debate about well, how God's sovereignty works with human suffering, but again, that is not the point of this letter. Peter isn't trying to spark debates of theology. He is trying to instill a hope in people who are, who are struggling to stand up amidst the hard realities of the world. Peter's writing to give us hope. And yes, when I say us, I know Peter didn't write these words to us. He wrote them to first century Christians. But these words apply to us because these words apply to anyone and everyone who is trying to follow Jesus. We have a living hope because we have a living Savior. And that changes everything. You have a living hope. Not wishful thinking. Not an abstract set of principles, but actually a living hope that changes everything. And guess what? That makes you weird. That's because we live in a world where bad news tends to dominate the news. Have you noticed this recently? We have good news that makes us weird. Peter says, this should cause others to ask some questions. Now, we'll talk about this in coming weeks to, to, to a greater degree. But he says this later in his letter. In chapter 3, he says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. The reason Peter says you should be ready to give an answer is because he assumes that following Jesus will cause others to say, Hey, what's going on? Why are you like that? Why did you do that? How do you have so much hope? Don't you know that we're in the middle of a global pandemic that will not end? Don't you know that the world is a mess? Don't you know that we're all lonely, that mental health is declined? Don't you know the reality we're living in? Peter says that your life should prompt some questions. Not that you would be dismissive of the hard realities of the world. Not that you would paint on a smile and peddle some wishy-washy, syrupy, happy, clappy niceness. But that you would speak of a hope that sustains through all things. A God who is at work and with us in all things. Simply put, Peter says you have something that should cause others to want to take a deeper look. Now back in chapter 1, back in today's passage, Peter speaks of two examples of this. And he says that, you know what, the prophets of old, the people that God used to prepare the world for the coming of Jesus, the people who told us in advance what God would do, they desperately wanted to see what you have. They want to understand the living hope that comes by those who are marked by the blood of Jesus. Pretty fascinating, even though it's probably not surprising. Of course the prophets would want to see that. But did you catch this in verse 12? Peter continues and he says this, Even angels long to look into these things. Even angels long to look in these things. If you follow Jesus... If you belong to Jesus, you have something that even the mysterious beings that surround God's thrones are like, are like, whoa, tell me more, 
show me more. I'm, I'm going to let that soak in for a moment here. The living hope that you have makes the beings around God's throne stand in awe. Of course, now I'm going to bring us back down to earth. Because earth is where we live, and earth is where uh, we're, we're, we we're called to stand out and to point to this hope. And by the way, coming down to earth, I'm really going to break it down to earth. Like, we're going to come from heaven and God's throne down to Chuck E. Cheese. Has anybody ever been to Chuck E. Cheese? Yeah, I don't frequent Chuck E. Cheese, number one, because I'm an adult. It's kinda, I don't want to be a creeper. Uh, secondly, I actually figure that Chuck E. Cheese is kind of scary, not just because of the animatronics. The pizza is a little scary as well. You know, a number of years ago, I went to Chuck E. Cheese with one of my children for a birthday party. And at that birthday party, I, I saw where I met a man named Rex. Now, Rex was there at the birthday party with his son, and Rex was equally terrified of Chuck E. Cheese. That's why the two of us hid in the corner, and we talked all night long. Seriously, we spent two hours together, and we talked about life and all of the realities of our world, and we talked about, honestly, everything that you could possibly think of, except for work. For some reason, Rex never asked me what I did for a living, and I was kind of glad he didn't ask me, because sometimes when people find out that you're a pastor, it's like telling them you're a leper. People run and go the other way. For some reason, Rex never asked me what I did, and so I didn't tell him what I did. And as such, Rex actually spent two hours talking to a pastor, and he actually began a friendship with a pastor. In fact, over the next few weeks and months, we would look for each other when we would drop our kids off at school or we would hang out for pickup. We started sitting together at school events. We started hanging out. And eventually, later on in the year, I invited Rex and his family to come to a party at my house. Something interesting happened at that party. After spending a couple of hours of talking to some of my neighbors and talking to lots of people from my church, Rex pulled me aside in the kitchen and he's like, JD, I've got to ask, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a pastor. And after he said a four-letter word, he said, that explains lots of things. <laughs> he said, I have been trying to figure out, because you said some things at Chuck E. Cheese that blew my mind. You, you're, you're, the way that you talked about the world and your life, I, I, I was, there was something about it. And I wanted to ask, but I was afraid to tell you, because I, well, I was afraid to ask what you did for a living, because I didn't want to tell you what I did for a living. And I was like, oh, what do you do for a living? He's like, I paint these. Rex was kind of embarrassed by this, but he actually is really good. In fact, Rex is one of the leading historical miniature figurine painters in the world, whatever that means. I don't know. He's really good. He was embarrassed about it, and he didn't want to tell me about it. It's not really the point. <laughs> the point is, is once Rex found out who I was, once he finally asked the question, we started talking. We started talking about spiritual things. And of course, one of the things that Rex told me was, you know what, if I had known you were a pastor, I probably wouldn't have talked to you. That's because he, he said, basically, I thought Christians were like the people that Francis Bufford described. But he said, I met you and there was something different. And then I met some of the people from your church and there was something unusual, something good and beautiful that I couldn't quite put my finger on. And those aren't his exact words, but that's what he said. He had to ask about it. Now, I wish I could put a nice little bow on the story and tell you that after Rex asked me what I did for a living, we started talking about spiritual things that he dropped to his knees and he prayed and he started following Jesus. But I can't tell you that because that's not what happened. What happened is we spent a couple of years having spiritual conversations, talking about Jesus and, and his involvement in the world. And I wish I could tell you that conversation is still going on, but honestly, Rex and I have kind of lost touch over the years. I, I, I moved away. But you know what? I pray for Rex when I think about him. I prayed a lot for him this week because I thought about him this week. I pray that he finds the hope that I have found in Jesus, the hope that he asked me so many questions about. And by the way, I pray the same thing for the shuttle driver that I had a conversation this week because he actually was really intrigued by the fact that I was a pastor when he picked me up at the church. You know, Peter doesn't promise us fairy tale endings if we follow Jesus. 
He doesn't promise that, oh, if you just follow Jesus, everyone is going to fall in love with him and want to, want, to, want to know more. No, Peter actually says, when some people find you're a follower of Jesus, they may oppose you. Like the people in this letter here. But some people are going to want to take a deeper look. Some people might catch a glimpse of what God is doing. Some people might catch a glimpse of this good and beautiful community that points to a good and beautiful God. Over the next few weeks, as we walk through the letter known as 1 Peter, we're going to talk about some very specific ways that God might show up. We're going to talk about the questionable things that we should do, and I mean that in a good way, that might invite others to ask questions. But today, the invitation is to live a life of hope. Hope is not something you have to beat people over the head with. Hope is not some pill of belief that you have to try to shove down someone else's throat. Hope is not something that you have to circle the wagons and protect. Hope is something that you hold on to and you hold out to the world. If you belong to Jesus, if you follow Jesus, you have something that the world is looking for. So live accordingly. Be open to the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Be obedient to Jesus. Be weird in all the right ways. And pray for a sovereign God to be at work. For the glory of His name. For the hope of the world. Even us. Would you pray with me?